Our good buddy from uh, Pro Football Focus, senior analyst Steve Palazzolo, joining us on the program. Are you going to be the one who defends Greg Williams in that moment, Steve? Uh, somewhat. I mean, I never thought I'd be a Greg Williams defender, but here's my thing with it. It's just, it's not as egregious maybe as people are saying. That's my, that's my biggest takeaway from this thing. Yes, it's what Greg Williams does. He likes to put pressure. Uh, but I look at it, it, the general takeaway is, well, he's tanking. It got called in. It's a tank job. It looks completely different from what people normally do. I really think Greg Williams, first off, it's in his nature. He would blitz his mom if she was out there, right? But he, he likes to attack at those times, and it's the way he was handling Derek Carr during that game. You know, there was a fourth and eight, you know, a few plays before where he went all out. It didn't work for him, right? Um, but Derek Carr was bad against the blitz in this game. He it was 0 for 6 throwing the ball down the field against the blitz. He was fidgety in the pocket. He was throwing off balance. It essentially forced Derek Carr and the Raiders to execute, and they did. It's risky for sure, but – you're putting the pressure on them to react quickly. And when you bring that many people, you can't buy time. When you look at Hail Mary's, the Aaron Rodgers one against the Cardinals, the quarterback generally has to buy time. And I think you just have to give Derek Carr a ton of credit. After he was fidgeting in the pocket the whole game, he stepped up. He found oh, your job as a quarterback against the zero blitz is to find a play, way to throw it. Mahomes likes to retreat. Some guys roll out. Wilson retreats. Derek Carr stepped up, found the one place where he could throw the ball from the pocket and executed and made a great play. It's just not as egregious of a play call, I think, as everybody's making it out to be. Well, here's my problem with it, Steve. You can send seven or eight guys if you want to, but my secondary has to know a couple of things. Don't bite on a double move and nobody gets behind you. And I, I said I would fire Greg Williams just for that. You can send your seven guys. You want to put pressure on Carr. I understand it. That's your style. But my secondary bit on a double move, and they had nobody over the top, and Ruggs was able to beat them deep. That, to me, is inexcusable for a guy who has as, as many years on the job as Greg Williams does. I mean, I would, I would rather have one more safety back. I do think that the execution – it's not. It's tough to put this on Lamar Jackson on an island, right? The cornerback, not the quarterback. It's tough to put it on the corners who are sitting on an island or Marcus May on the previous one who was on an island in, in the fourth and eight. He had to grab Darren Waller. Uh, but I do think that the execution of the play wasn't great. I think it's obvious. You know, you've got essentially one play to defend. You have to not let anything get behind you. There was also what people were calling a spy, you know, somebody spying Derek Carr. That was more just that guy was in man coverage. And once the Raiders max protected, he was just, you know, he should have been an add on blitzer. And I think if he executed that properly, the spot where Derek Carr was stepping up into the pocket, there's, there's a jet there. And so I think the execution of the play, while risky, was a big part of it as well. Do we know how good Sam Darnold is? What, what's pro football's focus, the assessment of Sam Darnold moving forward? I, I try to go back to the preseason takes. I think I said it on this show, too, that we won't actually learn a ton about Sam Darnold, at least statistically. He's going to come out of the season based off their, their situation and not look that great, right? Offensive line still has issues. The playmakers, not only did they have question marks coming in, but they've been hurt the entire season. But you just wanted to see a throw-for-throw throw improvement from Sam Darnold, and we just haven't seen that. We just have not seen a lot of the stuff that, we, that he showed at USC. You know, at USC, he was, as a redshirt, his, his best season was his redshirt freshman year, and he looked like he was just so far beyond his time, throwing with anticipation, and he had that fourth quarter magic, and so many of the things that you that just translate, that seem to translate at the NFL level, and we're not seeing that here. Decision making, accuracy, the situation hasn't been great, but he hasn't been elevating that lesser supporting cast. So in year three, yeah, that's a huge concern for Darnold. Okay, but how do you factor in a bad offensive line when you're assessing quarterback play? I, I think there's there's a, there's enough plays to evaluate. You know, even against a bad offensive line, you're still in a clean pocket 65% of the time, 60% of the time. So, you know, it's just evaluating on a throw-by-throw -throw basis and saying, yes, if things are better here, you'll have more of those clean pocket opportunities, but you still have to make those plays. And if you are under pressure, you know, Justin Herbert's been under pressure like crazy this year, and he's handled it really well. And I think what you've seen from Herbert is more of a his arm talents taking over. It's really tough for him to sustain Herbert, that play under pressure, but you're at least seeing those superstar types of glimpses. You all, you just don't see enough of those. I don't think from Sam Darnold. And, and here's the, here's the bottom line with quarterbacks. I think you're either a passenger or you're a conductor, right? You're either a guy that is leading the charge. That is 
that is carrying a bad offensive line or an average supporting cast, or you're a guy that needs everything to be pristine around you. So right now, Darnold at best is the guy that needs everything around him. And I think that is a big part of the evaluation going forward. Do you want to invest in a guy that everything needs to be perfect around just to get some production out of him? Is there a maturation process going on with Baker Mayfield that we should be aware of? He's just, it's, it's such a roller coaster ride. And we live in a roller coaster ride of an industry, right? Every Monday morning, we have to react to the thing we saw the, the previous day. In this year, on Monday mornings, I have reacted so negatively to stuff I've seen from Baker Mayfield. He doesn't throw passes with touch. He doesn't want to go through his reads. He's not progressing. He hates throwing from a clean pocket. And then all of a sudden, in recent weeks, he's improved in that area. So I do think there, <clears throat> there is an element to that. The, the system has been great. It's really tough to separate quarterback from system. I think the best way to do it is to hold up PFF grade against your general production numbers, whether it's passer rating or yards per attempt or any other number that you want. And so far this season, Baker Mayfield's stats have been better than his performance. But what we saw on Sunday, what we've seen at times in recent weeks, is the things they needed to improve upon. Just throwing a touch pass to Rashard Higgins for that 17-yard touchdown, fantastic. He wasn't doing that earlier in the year. He was playing like Brett Favre, just trying to throw 100-mile-an-hour laser beams all over the field. So just that, going through his progressions a little bit more, not vacating clean pockets. Some of those things have improved in recent weeks. And when you combine that with how the Browns have helped them systematically, it bodes really well for the Browns moving forward. Yeah, I just don't know what I'm getting. I think they have the blueprint to beat anybody in the AFC, including Kansas City, on the road because they run the football. They got a front four that can put pressure on the quarterback. I don't have to blitz. I got some skill position, guys. It just comes down to Baker Mayfield, it feels like. And then I look at Buffalo. I don't know what to expect out of Josh Allen, but it feels like when he plays well, he plays really well. And you saw that last night. How, where, where's the improvement with Josh Allen? Where have you seen it? Yeah, I called him last night one of the streakiest quarterbacks. And Bills fans aren't happy with PFF because we didn't love Josh Allen coming out. But he has improved in, in so many areas. It starts with accuracy uh, in the short area. This started last year. Passes up to 20 yards. You did not see this at Wyoming from Josh Allen. Just the ability to put the ball right on Cole Beasley's front number for catch and run opportunities. Those were passing, he, passes he was airmailing in college. So I think his footwork and accuracy in the short area has been fantastic. And then last year, he was a disaster when trying to throw the ball down the field. And that's one of those things that tends to fluctuate. It, depend, it depends a lot on the receivers that you have. And now we're seeing the combination of Allen's improvement plus what Buffalo's built around him, right? Having Stephon Diggs, having a rookie, Gabriel Davis, having John Brown when he's healthy, guys that can stretch the field. Over time, you're just going to have more opportunities to create those chunk plays, and Allen has done that. So the combination of his improvement in the short game and what Buffalo has done to build an incredible offense around him. I also love their play calling, right? We see so many offensive coordinators try to protect their young quarterback by going run, 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 pass, right? Yeah. And just yeah. it, they're in third and eight all the time. There are games where the Bills, this is very Belichickian, they, said, they did it against the Seahawks a few weeks ago. We can't run against the Seahawks, but we could pass. We're going to throw the ball 35 times before our, before our running back even carries it five times. That is to the, uh, to the favor of the quarterback, putting him in advantageous situations, throwing on early downs. And this started last year with the Bills. They put Allen in a great position to succeed. If I look at Josh Allen, he had six more completions of 20 or more yards. So his total in the season is 48. That ties him with Aaron Rodgers for third most in the NFL. Only Mahomes and Deshaun Watson have completed more down the field passes to what you were uh, you were saying. Uh, Carson Wentz, um, I thought maybe for confidence reasons I'd sit him down, and because what he was doing on the field was not helping him. And I want to see what I have in Jalen Hurts. I don't know if you can trade Carson Wentz, you know, with that big ticket price attached to him, but. I, this is an exploratory time if I'm the Eagles. Like, who are we and where are we going and who's going to lead us here? Did you see enough? Like, what did you assess with Jalen Hurts in what we thought was mop-up time, but it became a little bit closer in that game against Green Bay? Yeah, the Eagles are just in a really tough spot. It's one of those things, too. I loved the Jalen Hurts pick at the time because I'm all about just finding quarterbacks and quarterbacks that could be of value. I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I think it might be time for just a, a, a breather for Carson Wentz. And I think ultimately the Eagles are with it. They're tied to him over the next few years, unless, you know, they can pull off a miracle and, and flip him somewhere. If, if that's what they decide to do, 
So his long-term mental health and physical, all that stuff is like the most important thing right now for the Eagles. At the same time, you can find out what you have in Jalen Hurts. He, he, he added a little bit of a spark. And I'll, I'll use the same thing about Hurts that I've said about Taysom Hill, about Kyler Murray. When you have that rushing ability, it just brings a higher floor to your offense. Jalen Hurts is not the most polished passer. He's not going to sit through and make good reads 40 times a game. But if you add six, eight, ten carries per game, it just raises your floor where you don't have to be as good of a passer. And Hurts is a solid passer. He can hit open throws. He showed that at Alabama, showed it at Oklahoma. So I'm intrigued by what I saw, and I think it's, it's going to look a little bit different. You use him in the design running game. Um, I think you maybe increase your Jalen Hurts value, but I think ultimately the Eagles are tied to, tied to Wentz, and they need him to get back to where he was in 2017 and 18. Steve Palazzolo, Pro Football Focus Senior Analyst, and uh, PFF is revealing a new product called PFF IQ for teams and agents that use PFF data in their aid to build a team, roster management. you got free agency coming up. Uh, Dak Prescott's um, leverage. Uh, coming off an injury, surgery, team's not performing well. So now what happens once these two – uh, sides get back together again. Are we talking franchise? Or are we talking long term? I, I think they'll figure it out long term. The only place Dak has lost leverage, I think, with Dallas is that they might be picking in the top 10. And all of a sudden, you know, the Kyle Trasks of the world and the Zach Wilsons of the world have emerged. And it went from a two QB race at one and two with Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. And all of a sudden, Mac Jones, too, who'll be on the show, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You have these other guys who are intriguing first round talents. And Dallas has that uh, has that other option. I think Dak's leverage is strong though because if you look at his career, he's got four plus seasons of action. I think in two of those seasons, he's looked like a top 10 quarterback, two seasons he hasn't. This year, he was on his way to a third top 10 caliber season. When you have that top 10 caliber quarterback, you get him, you lock him up and you and you live with that guy. I think that's what Dak has been these last couple of years. So I think the last football we've seen from Dak is so positive. Whether it's in Dallas or somewhere else, he's the hottest commodity in free agency. And we've seen teams that with their with their with when you have the mid-tier quarterback, you just don't know what you're gonna get. You could have a Kirk Cousins type season, which is nice right now. You could have a you know a Matthew Stafford type season, which is inconsistent. I think Dak brings a level of consistency that the NFL teams are going to covet on the open market. And I know Jerry needs to win now, wants to win now, and almost every owner wants to win now. But I wonder if they sat there and all of a sudden you did have Zach Wilson or Kyle Trask, uh, Trey Lance. Like you just, you know, does Jerry go, I could get that rookie quarterback contract and I could continue to fill my team with fat contracts here. And, and get out from under Dak Prescott's $40 million a year. Do you, do you think Jerry has the patience to be able to do that in a situation like this? So, so that's the exact discussion I think they're going to have. And the exact thing, I think, when we sit down and we've built PFFIQ, which is this way of helping teams kind of make these decisions, we've realized, look, the, the rookie contract thing is great. But it's greater if you know that quarterback is going to be good. When it's Russell Wilson on a rookie contract or Dak, on a rookie contract as a fourth rounder. That's one of the biggest steals in the NFL uh, since 2016. If you know the guy's going to be good, that's fine. But there's inherent risk in a Zach Wilson, a Kyle Trask, Mac Jones, whoever it might be, because you've just you've never seen him at the NFL level. There's something to the known commodity in Dak Prescott. I think ultimately that wins out. But the debate will be rookie year contract in this great supporting cast compared to the Dak contract. I don't think the Dak level contract is as detrimental as people think it is if the quarterback is good. And I think he's proven that at 40 million or whatever that number is, he will be worth it. Steve, always great to talk to you. We appreciate your insights. Thank you. You got it. Thank you, Dan. That's uh, Steve Palazzolo, uh, one of the senior analysts there at Pro Football Focus.